So with that, let's read Psalm 115 together. Uh, Psalm 115, starting at verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Why should the nations say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. And they have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. And those who make them will become like them, everyone who trusts in them. O Israel, I trust, O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord. The small together with the great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. The heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth he's given to the sons of men. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence. But as for us, we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forever. Praise the Lord. praise you and we thank you for your goodness and your grace to us lord that uh, we we get to worship the true and the living god and that we get to worship you in spirit and in truth so we ask that you would guide this study tonight that you would uh, bless the teaching bless the hearing and that we would leave edified by your grace today in your name amen so uh, for those of you keeping track on the little chart this is the last entry in the section that we've sort of designated Christian life. You know, we did uh, church and uh, fellowship, suffering, uh, a couple of others in there. And so sort of taking all of the theological concepts that we would gained up to that point and sort of putting uh, feet to those legs, uh, walking through what that looks to us, looks like to us practically. And uh, worship is a very important part of our practical walk as Christians. Indeed, uh, we could spend much more time than we will spend uh, talking about how worship is really a state of being for the life of the believer. And I have to admit, uh, I am uh, a little humbled in, in speaking of this subject, of, of the many things that I'm okay at talking about. This is actually uh, not one of them. It's something that I'm still learning about and growing in. Um, and I've got a bit of a spotty history with it. Uh, you see, uh, I've come from a background where I've been called out for not singing loud enough in church or not singing at all. And they say that I'm uh, uh, an inadequate worshiper because I don't sing loud or well. Uh, I've been called out for not speaking in tongues. Uh, I've sat in conferences and listened to people say that uh, if you want to have an altar call, make sure you hit those minor chords, you know, so that you can get the music to to get the people where they want to go, you know, if you want to, if you want to have a really good offering, make sure you play a couple of really nice hip and peppy songs. And so I've gotten to see what the church has done with this notion of worship firsthand. And it's, uh, for a long time, it left me with something of a sour taste in my mouth. Um, but thankfully by the grace of the Lord, uh, he's worked that out of me. Um, Almost like those little goji berries that Deb keeps trying to give me. All of a sudden, everything's sweet, you know. <laughs> Deb's got these magic berries that if you eat them, everything becomes sweet. It's it's funny. Um, and so, you know, I've gotten to see where we've uh, misconstrued things, where we've misinterpreted things and misapplied things. Uh, and I've gotten to see 
the truth of the scriptures and the beauty of, of true worship. And so uh, today, part of my objective is to sort of set some of those other things aside. You know, we're not going to talk about which chord progression is best to get a healthy altar call. Uh, and we're, we're really not going to talk about music much at all, except for here at the start. We're going to talk about worship as a state of being, uh, as those who are saved by the blood of Jesus, as those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Uh, worship should simply be, uh, really, if we look at the scripture, something as natural as breathing. And so while singing is sort of that mountaintop experience, there is a whole mountain below it. And I'd like to sort of look at some of the big boulders in that mountain today with you. Uh, so um, as we said, uh, I'm, I'm here to tell you that worship is more than singing songs. Uh, but it's not to exclude the singing of songs. Uh, we're to sing together for a variety of reasons, not the least of which that we're commanded by the Lord. Uh, in Psalm 147, 147 1, uh, they write, Praise the Lord. It's good to sing praises to our God. It is pleasant and praise is becoming. Uh, again, as we've been uh, saved and regenerated, it's good to return thanks to the Lord in song. It's something that binds us together. It lifts up our hearts. It uh, increases fellowship, uh, really. Uh, the command continues in uh, the New Testament in James chapter 5 and verse 13. James writes uh, quickly, Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. This is one of several commands in the New Testament reminding us uh, to sing to our God. We're to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and so forth. So I'm not saying that worship isn't to exclude singing. I'm saying that singing is the cherry on top of the great worship Sunday that should be our life. Uh, so I'm, I want to look more at the Sunday tonight. And that's why I chose Psalm 115. And so the first point that I would like to establish with us tonight uh, that we can see in our text, we're going to be looking at verses 3, 4, and 8 of Psalm number 115. First point that I'd like to draw from those verses is the notion that, first of all, everyone worships, and second of all, you become like what you worship. This is one of the reasons why this psalm is a personal favorite of mine. Um, it's because it illustrates in uh, no uncertain terms that everyone worships. I did a little bit of really quick internet research leading up to this, and the number I see on the internet is folks around the world worship something like 2,600 deities uh, being worshipped. I think that might be 2,600 religions, because I think the Hindus have tens of thousands of gods just in their religion. Uh, but at any rate, uh, at any rate um, you don't have to go far to see people engaged in worship. Uh, it's often quite clear what the objects of someone's worship are. They usually have a statue or they have a, a building that they go to and uh, they offer their prayers to their deity. Um, and it's easy to see that in these far-flung corners. But here in the sophisticated West, we don't often see that. You won't often see uh, people putting up statues uh, in their houses to what they worship. And you'll probably hear people scoff if you tell them that they are in fact worshiping something, that they do have a God over them. But I'm here to tell you, that they do have a God over them. Uh, and if it's not the one true God, then the only option left is some false God. And that should be, as we see in our text, a grave warning uh, to those. Uh, we have our own pantheon, uh, which we place above us in God-like devotion. Um, perhaps uh, for some it might be notoriety, perhaps sex, or perhaps uh, you might even take yourself to be your own God, uh, involved in some narcissistic act of self-worship. We all recognize that there is someone above us, and we will all bend the knee to someone or something. It's hard, we're, we're hardwired to do it. I think one of the great lies of our time is that man is a neutral agent. Uh, you will be in the worshipful service of someone or something, at least as far as the Bible is concerned. There is no neutrality. A couple of verses to emphasize this uh, going backwards through the scriptures, starting at Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth. A couple of books prior to that, in Micah chapter 4 and verse 5, 
God says, uh, or Micah is calling the children of Israel out here. He says, though all the peoples walk, each in the name of his God. As for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. And finally, in Joshua, that great commission that Joshua gives at the end of the book, uh, calling the children of Israel out, uh, forcing them to make a choice. He says, now, therefore, yeah, I got it up there. Okay. Excuse me. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served, which are beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There will be a God above your life. Uh, and the choice is, is it going to be the true living God or some false construct? And as I said, uh, in our text, we see that the warning is dire because there in verse 8, you see... Uh, the result of worship improperly applied. Those who see them become like them. If your God can't think on a long enough timeline, you'll stop thinking. If your God can't see on a long enough timeline, you'll stop seeing. Uh, and you don't have to look very far to see people devolving in this way in our day and in our age uh, before our very eyes. And so uh, we're... We're created to worship, we will worship something, and we will become uh, more and more like the thing that we worship. So, uh, as, as we see in our Psalm 115 text, uh, those who fall away and worship other gods uh, become like them. And conversely, there are blessings, both temporal and eternal, in worshiping the one true God and recognizing him for who he is and exalting his goodness. So, uh, yeah, in James chapter 4 and verse 10, we're told to humble ourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. So we worship. We worship the one true God, not some false God. But as we do, and as we do, we're lifted up. Uh, it is part of our sanctification, being made more and more holy as we walk with him. But this isn't the main reason uh, to worship. No, we worship uh, in order to exalt God uh, simply because he's worthy of the exaltation. So we've established that there is something to worship, the one true God, uh, as opposed to all the other uh, forms and modes of worship out there. We've established so far that worship is more than singing. Uh, so what does worship look like then? And I think we can see the pattern for worship beginning from the very first pages of the Bible. To worship God is to be obedient to God and his commands. Um, so starting at the very beginning, uh, we see God creating Adam and Eve, a story so familiar many of us could probably recite it without even uh, the need of a Bible. Um, but look at what is happening uh, between God and man in this story. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. That's interesting, male and female, he created them. And blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over, over every living thing that moves over the earth. Excuse me. Later in chapter 2, God adds that they're not to eat from the tree uh, of the knowledge of good and evil. But that's it. There's no call to worship in Genesis. There's no building of altars. There's no psalter given to them. Uh, they're just given a task to do and expected to do it. Um, and so uh, this is something that... Uh, continues through the law and through the prophets, uh, through the kings and the chronicles. Um, when God commissions people, he expects them to be obedient to his call. He called Abraham out of the land of the uh, out of the land of his fathers into the promised land. He calls people here and there, and obedience is part of that uh, life of worship. Uh, Jesus finally summarizes it perfectly for us, as he always does in John chapter fourteen and verse fifteen. If you love me, oops. I'm way off. There it is. There it is. Okay, sorry. Genesis, or sorry, John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And if you look at those uh, individuals in the Old Testament held up as examples to us, obedience is one of the key character elements. They hear from God 
They do what he says. And that's what God created us to do from the beginning. He gave us a commission, wanted us to do it. That is a key part of worship. Second, continuing in Genesis, we worship God in fellowship. So we worship God in obedience and we worship God in fellowship. So uh, one part of the fall account that is often overlooked is how God found Adam and Eve. Uh, it's a very brief little snippet there in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves uh, from the presence of God among the trees. Apparently, this was part of the normal program uh, prior to the fall that uh, God and Adam and Eve, uh, it seems like we could infer from the text anyways, that they had this relationship, this ongoing time where they were together and, and in communion and communication, uh, except this time when God came down to, to fellowship with them, they had attempted to hide themselves. And we, we again see this as a pattern throughout the Old Testament when we see those faithful men uh, listed for us, held up to us as examples, there's this element of fellowship with them. Uh, in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So as we just said, it's a hallmark of the great men given to us in the Old Testament. God tells them where to go and what to do and they do it. And there's a communication back and forth. There's a communication, there's movement. Uh, remembering our prior observation about obedience. But perhaps nowhere is this more concisely said than in the book of Exodus, uh, this remarkable relationship between Moses and God is summarized there in Exodus chapter 33. The Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Yunan, a young man, would not depart the tent. So when we worship... We're worshiping God and we're worshiping face to face. And there's this element of, of communication, of fellowship there with him. We're uh, enjoying the presence of God uh, for all the good things that he uh, has uh, given to us and done for us, for the good that he is. And uh, it's personal. It's it's relational. Um, so uh, worship, uh, in addition to all of the other things, it's, it's something in fellowship. And it's uh, something that should be included in our prayer life. Thirdly, uh, worship is sacrifice. Uh, there's no concise verse for this, uh, but I would point you to the first half of the book of Leviticus. There you will find in graphic detail uh, clear instruction on the sacrificial system that God prescribes for the national worship of him by the children of Israel, and it's a very bloody affair. A constant reminder that we're under the awful curse of death, and there must be the shedding of blood to bring about remission of sins. The idea is ever present that a sacrifice is necessary to worship God. Hebrews again brings us some clarity in this, for we see in the book of Hebrews that Christ is not only our perfect priest, he's also our perfect sacrifice. No more do we need bulls and goats to curry favor with God. And there in the book of Leviticus, you'll see different types of offerings. You'll see guilt offerings and sin offerings and such. But there is another class of offering that God gives uh, to the children of Israel that is worth our time to, to think about today. The free will offering or the thank offering. This is an offering given to God simply because he's good and he's blessed us with good things. I think as we think through worship, we need to think through the sacrificial element of it. Not only that we are invited into fellowship with God by way of the sacrifice of his son, but that worship can be our free will offering, our thank offering uh, in return to him. Not something that is uh, compelled from us, not something that we do to, to gain favor, but just something that we can do out of the joyful uh, thanks of our heart uh, to return to God uh, something uh, in, in thanks for all the good that he's done to us. Uh, Christ, our great high priest, is our perfect sacrifice. He completely paid our sin debt and allows us communion with God. And part of that communion is a thank offering. So when we serve God with our hands, give God uh, from, we give to God from the abundance of what he gives us. We or praise his goodness with our mouths and we're worshiping and giving thank offerings. So thank offerings can take different forms as well, uh, be they songs of praise or uh, sacrifices of money or time uh, or labor, but uh, worship is uh, sacrifice in that sense. And finally, 
then we'll move into discussion after this point. Worship is humbling. <coughs> Pardon me. If you were with us on Sunday, you know that I've been going through the old memory verses my dad made me memorize. And Micah 6, 8 was one of them. Uh, Micah writes, With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before God Most High? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? No, he answers in verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. When we worship God, when we uh, enter into his throne room in that way, and we see his perfection and his glory impressed upon our hearts and in our minds, it brings us to that uh, humble walk, that uh, state of total dependence on him. And so as we worship and as we come there, uh, perhaps our prayer should be like that of Job. This is going to be the one that stays on the screen for our discussion time. Job, after all of that, uh, after all of his uh, talking back and forth with his friends, when he finally gets a chance to answer back to God, he says, Behold, I'm insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. And so as we worship God, as we thank him for all the many good things that he's done for us, uh, for the invitation that we have, uh, for the anchor within the veil that he's given to us, uh, it should also uh, bring us to recall the bigness of God, uh, the significance of our sin in damaging that relationship, and the beauty of his restoring act in uh, s sending us that perfect sacrifice. And that should drive us yet to more worship. So uh, we'll see if John wants to pick up the baton next week or if he wants to talk about uh, angels and demons, uh, which is a subject that I'm sure no one is interested in at all. I've, I've never, never heard anyone express any interest in that sort of thing. But that's sort of uh, uh, an introduction uh, into worship. That your will worship something. Your worship is uh, to be something of obedience. It's to be something of sacrifice. It's to be uh, something of fellowship. And it's to bring you to a place of humility before the Lord. With that, let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for this time. We thank you that, you've, that you are our anchor within the veil and that you've paid it all, and that we get to worship you now and practice for eternity. We ask now that you bless this time in your name.